just wait for my slides to, to appear. But uh, I, this is my first meeting, and so far I'm having a great time. So thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, I'm looking very forward to speaking to you guys about vaccine hesitancy and measurement. And in particular, as Cornelia was saying, um, the focus of my presentation is about the psychometric evaluation of a measure that was developed by the SAGE Working Group on Vaccine Hesitancy. Some of it is a little bit technical, but I think it's important, so stay with me and I'll try and make it as relevant as possible. Okay. So some of you may be familiar with this caricature. It's really a suggestion that vaccine hesitancy is not a new phenomenon. It's really existed since vaccines were introduced. This is from 1802 in Britain, and this caricature is entitled the cowpox, or the wonderful effects of the new inoculation. It really exaggerates the fears um, that getting the smallpox vaccine will create bovine features. Um, so clearly the exaggeration and concern of vaccines is, is not new. But the study of vaccine hesitancy using that term is a new phenomenon. Here you can see I tracked the number of articles using the term vaccine hesitancy in PubMed from 2005 until um, uh, 2017. And you can see even though that, like the, the term vaccine hesitancy is uh, in articles is actually quite um, rare. So at less than 200 articles a year um, use that term, but it's really growing. And particularly after where you see the star, the SAGE Working Group on Vaccine Hesitancy began their work, this is now becoming an increased focus um, of, uh, and an attention of uh, the academic community. So most of us here will know that vaccine hesitancy is the refusal or delay in acceptance of uh, vaccines despite the availability of services. But it's really important when you think about measurement to understand that this is actually a very vague term. It reflects individuals um, who have multiple behaviors. So I wanna stress the behaviors here. So there are people who refuse all vaccines. There are individuals who refuse only some vaccines like influenza, but will accept others like measles. And then there is individuals who have accepted the vaccine, but were really hesitant about it. Um, but they did it under pressure or things like that. So all these people, um, different behaviors, still considered vaccine hesitant. And vaccine hesitancy doesn't only reflect the behaviors, but it also reflects divergent attitudes. And this 3C model by Heidi and her group um, also discusses uh, different attitudes that are related to vaccine hesitancy. And these can be about lacking of confidence in a vaccine, in the program, in your provider, being complacent, so not perceiving a need for vaccines or um, not valuing vaccination. And it can also be about um, lack of access and convenience of accessing the vaccine. I know that there's efforts to expand this model and you'll hear a, bit, a little bit about that later. So there are multiple aspects that can affect vaccine hesitancy. This is a great model that shows that it's related to um, health professionals' recommendation. Media is really important, and I'll discuss media more in a minute. Um, what we do in public health services and what the government services do can really impact it. And then there's a host of historical, political, and social cultural uh, events that can also impact uh, vaccine hesitancy. My colleagues and I have used that model and uh, modified it for the HPV vaccine, which is actually the focus of a lot of my other work. Um, and we've tried to make it more nuanced in terms of the social, political, and cultural factors that really are important to the HPV vaccine. But we also hear what I'd like to show you is that we, we describe in our theory that vaccine hesitancy and vaccine uptake is really, um, it's only through our attitudes that actually, um, that they're transmitted. So the centrality of attitudes is really important in this model. So I, I, I really think that social media and some of the other work I've been doing on Twitter has um, shown that vaccine hesitancy on Twitter is really related to vaccine uptake. We don't know what comes first, but there's a strong correlation. Um, and so you can see that in, this, in social media, when tweets like this are liked and retweeted quite often, it's really having an impact. Here you can see the impact of vaccine hesitancy on the HPV vaccine in two countries, Colombia and Ireland, compared to the more stable vaccine um, uptake rates in Australia. 
So that green line shows you Australia's rates over time, and this is all looking at girls, because so I want to make it as comparable as possible. Um, and then in Colombia and Ireland, due to an anti-vaccine, and I will describe them as a movement, um, uh, and also due to a lot of social media, there was dramatic decline in vaccination rates. Japan is another example, but uh, unfortunately I couldn't access data over time for them, so that's why they're not displayed here. But this is why we need to pay more attention to vaccine hesitancy. It's not just a, a theory, it's not just an attitude or a behavior, but it can have a massive impact on our programs, and it can occur anywhere. Colombia, Ireland, Japan, it's really not specific to a certain area, so I think it affects all of us in different parts of the world. It doesn't only impact HPV, just this last weekend. Um, the New York Times reported on the situation, which many of you will be familiar with, that's occurring in Italy. In Italy in 2016, there was just over 800 of measles events. A year later in 2017, there's now over 5,000 measles events. <laughs> so clearly this is uh, not specific to any one vaccine as well, um, although HPV is often described as a vaccine where there's a lot of hesitancy. This can be impact any vaccine in any place. Which brings us to the need for measurement. So because this is such a divergent and, um, but a, a big topic, it really is important to compare. It's important to compare vaccine hesitancies over time and in, in a specific country. It's important to compare vaccine hesitancy across countries. And the reason why we do this is to examine the patterns, the correlates, and ideally the predictors because that way we can prevent vaccine hesitancy and the impact it can have on our programs, um, and, it, and we can track it over time and respond to it as quickly as possible. So this, this study will look at a vaccine hesitancy scale that was developed by the SAGE Working Group on Vaccine Hesitancy that was led by Heidi and her team. Um, and this is a, a scale that actually can have a really important effect on the advancement of research, but also immunization policy. But it had not been psychometrically validated, and actually in their article, they encouraged that other teams will do this work. So I, uh, as a PhD student, raised my hand <laughs> and said I'd be very happy to study this scale and look at its impact in the Canadian population. Um, so we looked in this study at the structure, the reliability, the construct and criterion validity, and I know some of you may or may not be familiar with those terms. I'll, I'll explain them as I go along. Okay, so here you can see the items of the vaccine hesitancy scale. There are 10 items, and they're, um, they're measured from a scale from one to five. What we did is we reversed, when we scored it, we reversed certain um, items, which are the ones with the R there, and so that way every, we can measure them all similarly so that more vaccine hesitancy um, was described by higher numbers, right? Um, so one of the examples of the items is childhood vaccines are effective. Another one was new vaccines carry more risks than older vaccines, just to give you a sense. So when they designed this um, scale, it has a lot of face validity, um, which is means that they consulted a lot of experts. So this was the whole SAGE working group was working on this, and these were items that they all, all agreed were relevant. So that's what we call face validity. But we don't know what underlies these constructs and how they hold together. So that was the work that we did. In, we collected um, data on over 4,600 parents in Canada, um, looking at um, parents of, or guardians of 9 to 16 year old children. And we look at that age group just to be transparent because I'm particularly interested in other questions related to the HPV vaccine. Um, but I think this would hold for younger parents as well. The recruitment is actually um, facilitated by Leger Marketing, which is uh, the biggest polling and marketing research firm in Canada. Um, and that means that we could actually collect the data within two or three weeks um, in September 2016 and a large amount of data. So they have access to over 400,000 parents. And when they can't get the data in that amount of time, they subcontract out. So it's actually a very convenient way of getting a lot of data very quickly um, and also to make it represent, uh, representative of the Canadian population. So they have a number of different criteria. I'd be happy to discuss that a bit later. Um, and the other point that I want to emphasize is, is this is a study that was done in Canadian population in a specific time period, September 2016. But fortunately, we've also um, had funding to do a, a second wave of the data, and that was collected a year later. So, but I'm reporting now on the data from that time. <coughs> 
So Canadian parents were asked to fill us out a survey, which was around 35 minutes long. And they completed the survey in either of Canada's national languages, so English or French. Um, and this survey used intelligent programming. So the survey, didn't because it was done online, we could ask them not just to complete information about a child or their child, but we can personalize it. So it would be about Sally or Jim. Um, which And we can also change the questions that they would be asked depending on um, how they responded to specific questions. Another nice thing about this, um, having it not being online, is that we could control for what we call order effects. So the 10 items you saw earlier were not given in the same order to every parent, but we actually mix up the order to make sure that there was no order effects in, the, in, in how we administered. The measures we used was the vaccine hesitancy scale. We also included a lot of questions on sociodemographics because I'm interested in um, whether different subgroups of the population are more hesitant than others. Uh, we also include information on vaccine attitudes, so parents' um, beliefs about harms of vaccines, their trust in vaccines, the benefits of vaccination, um, and also another scale that we have developed and validated in my lab called the Vaccine Conspiracy Belief Scale, which I was happy to hear some information about conspiracy beliefs and vaccination yesterday. That's another um, important area that we want to, we continue to look at. We also look at the parents' vaccine decision-making stage, and we use a health psychology theory called the precaution adoption process model to do that. It's a really nice theory that can divide in one question parents' has vaccine hesitancy into gr six groups. Um, so we can talk more about that later. And vaccine refusal was the last um, important aspect of what we asked parents. So did they refuse the HPV vaccine? Did they refuse any other vaccine? So let me show you what we found. First of all, the data we collected, the final data set was um, comprised of 3,779 parents that completed the survey in predominantly English, but also a substantial minority in French. So those of you who are paying very close attention would notice that this is slightly less than how many I reported that we actually recruited. And that's because in our lab we do um, very careful uh, statistics to try and understand who are carelessly responding to our surveys, and we eliminate those from our final sample because in a 35-minute survey, you don't want people who are just saying yes to every question. We then conducted an exploratory and confirmatory factor analysis to see how those 10 items, what were the constructs that are behind them? So what are um, actually driving those 10 different items? And what we found was that there's two subscales, so those 10 items hang together really by two different um, underlying constructs. One that was called lack of confidence, and the other one that was characterized by concern about risks. Um, and importantly, actually, seven of the items hung on the lack of confidence, and two of the items hung on the, the risks, right? Um, that adds up only to nine. And the tenth item actually hung equally on both, so we actually don't actually think it's a very good, useful item in trying to determine lack of confidence from risks, so we didn't use it in our um, subscales. Also, we looked at the internal reliability, and both of those actually was quite good as to how they, the, the questions in a single factor relate to each other. Um, and these were actually, uh, these were quite good. The uh, only issues with risks is because there's only two items that technically doesn't actually hang together usually quite well. That's very consistent with other reports, but the inter-item correlations um, was quite good. Okay, and looking at the construct validity, was, which is how the construct of vaccine hesitancy relates to other attitudes that you think it should relate to or should not relate to, um, th that actually was very good in this, um, in this scale. So we found that both the subscales, lack of confidence and risks of the vaccine hesitancy scale, related positively to vaccine conspiracy beliefs and to harms, which is exactly what we would think and related negatively to trust in vaccines and the benefits of vaccination. And these are quite uh, moderate to strong relationships, which is also um, quite interestingly uh, interesting, but I also wanted to point out, you see where the arrow is, is the relationship between these two subscales. It's only 0.44. That's actually quite high, but not as high as the other relationships. And what that really tells us is that we're measuring two different things here in this um, scale that these, although there's some overlap, there's also a substantial amounts of difference. Now, most importantly, I think, is to look at how the scale um, is, is really related to real-world outcomes. And so I wanted to look at how 
the the HP the, the both the subscales of the VHS um, would are they related to either refusing the HPV vaccine or refusing another vaccine? And at, using independent sample t tests, we found that there's actually a medium to large effect size here in the relationship. So parents who are refusing the vaccine are actually reporting a lot of vaccine hesitancy. Interestingly as well, in the Canadian population, and I'll stress that it's, um, it's the Canadian population, that there was a greater endorsement of the risks um, subscale than compared to the lack of confidence subscale. So if you look at the mean here, and I'll remind you that five, one to it's measured one to five, and five being high vaccine hesitancy, you know, three is actually um, a little bit higher than I would have thought. Um, if you think about everyone on average, I would have thought on average the po Canadian population would have reported, um, you know, not that they're not very hesitant or they're not very concerned about risks um, overall. Um, but that is a, more of a concern than the issue about lack of confidence. As I mentioned, I was also very interested in the sociodemographic differences. And when we looked at gender, when we look at income, when we look at whether someone was born in Canada, we did find um, significant differences in the population. But I also, we looked at the effect size of these relationships, and they were actually very small. So although there is a significant relationship between certain groups, it's not a huge cause for concern. It's not a huge effect size. Income was the, actually the greatest effect size, and that was only small. Um, but what we did find is that individuals who have higher income were actually had less vaccine hesitancy. So that was um, also a little bit of a surprise to us. So I would like to emphasize that, um, first of all, a standardized measure of vaccine hesitancy is really important so that we can start comparing vaccine hesitancy in the world and start predicting it and hopefully preventing vaccine um, or vaccination programs from having a sudden drop in uptake. This scale in particular um, has fa been found to have good criterion and constant validity. Um, and there's two factors that are really are underlying um, this scale, and that is the lack of confidence and risks. And other research have pointed to, that, to the fact that these are two really important constructs. So that's, that's the good story. There are some limitations to this measure, as there are to all measures. And for example, um, the fact that only two items loaded on risks and seven items loaded on the lack of confidence, perhaps we want to balance these out a little bit better in the future. The other issue is that um, the risks items were both worded in a way that was negative, whereas the lack of confidence items were all uh, worded in a way that was positive. So when these separate out in our factor analysis, part of, uh, um, part of the question that remains is, is this due to the content or the tone? So that's something we need to also address in future research. So one of the next steps, I think, in the future research uh, that we need to do when we start thinking about developing or improving on the measures we have is to construct a nomological model. So this is very common in the construction of measurements where you say, okay, instead of starting with the items and then what are the constructs underlying them, you say, okay, what are the constructs we want this to measure? So we have the, uh, what should vaccine hesitancy comprise of? Is this a behavior? Is it an attitude? And then we go from there and develop the items accordingly. As I mentioned, we may want to modify some of the items um, that are currently in the scale. We also want to start assessing other aspects of psycho psychometrics that we didn't get to in this paper. For example, looking at the predictive and test retest validity that hopefully with the second wave of data we'll now be able to do. We also um, really think it's important so we conduct evaluations on different vaccines and when we, when we think about this scale. We, have to, uh, we, do con we also conduct investigations in different populations and that we translate this scale to different languages and the psychometric evaluation will actually be different. So it's important to make sure that it's, um, it's a valid tool in different languages as well. So this is uh, um, the, the manuscript that was published based on this research. I would like to first and, um, fo and foremost thank my collaborators who provided a lot of input and not only them, but uh, there's a huge team behind me um, and who are always very willing to answer questions. And I couldn't have, um, couldn't have conducted this work without them and also the Canadian government and uh, the Canadian Cancer Society who funded this work. So I'd um, be very happy to take any questions you guys have about this work. So thank you. <laughs>